Amen. Good morning, Harris Creek. So glad you guys are with us. If we haven't met, my name is JP or Jonathan Pacluda, and I have the privilege of serving on staff here. And let me just tell you, it's great to see faces, okay? I'm, I'm, I'm thankful that you're here and that I get to look at you and be up here and, and actually talk to, to people. You may have to, to smile extra big today and, and respond. And, and uh, I know that a lot of you are first-time guests uh, this morning, and so we've uh, asked our members to uh, not be here to, uh, you know, continue to help us learn what to do in this time of social distancing and whatnot. And uh, it's... It's like exciting to be here. Like people have asked, how have you felt? They're like, hey, are you excited to be back in there? I'm like, I am, but it's just, you know, it's not, we're not there yet, right? It's, we're not where I wanna be. And uh, it wasn't very long ago. I mean, two months ago, this place, we were 110, 120% capacity was overflow. We had people in the aisles. And, and today you can just kind of tell we're spaced out, you know, we're walking around. There's people with the face masks on in the, in the grocery store. And so it's different. I mean, we learned, if we've learned anything in this, it's like how fast everything changes. Like in a moment, everything can change. And so COVID-19, like who saw it coming? And here we are. And so we at Harris Creek, Creek, we've really had to reinvent ourselves for a season, just try to figure out what's the best way to love and care for and shepherd people in this season. And so uh, you guys know, for me, a lot of my travel hits, uh, I'll do about 90% of my travel in the summertime. And so I'm, that, that's coming. And so you're going to hear from some world-class communicators uh, as we move into a new series called Summer of Stories. And uh, one, of those, one of the places I'm traveling to, one of the states, you have to take a COVID-19 test before you go. And so they're making sure that no one you know, enters the state with, with the virus. And uh, while I'm not excited about shoving something way up my nose and, and getting a finger prick and whatnot, I am excited to get the results of that test. Right, to see if I've had it, if I have it. You know, I want to know. And that, that's interesting because, like, a, my, a, my buddy, uh, a, actually a cousin, uh, he got the, they tested for antibodies and he had the antibodies. So he never knew that he had the virus, but he actually did. And, and there's all these opinions out there like, hey, we're all going to get it. I've heard that. Um, many of us have had it, but they haven't shown symptoms. Has anybody heard that? that a lot of people have, have had it, and, but they just didn't know. And so I'm like, man, I can't wait to find out. Like, like that'd be, it's gonna be great to go and you know, get tested and somebody's gonna say, okay, hey, you had it or you haven't had it. Uh, I wanna know, it's like this binary result. And could you imagine if I could do that right now to find out if you were a Christian? Like that would kind of like, you know, if, or maybe even somebody in your family, like you get a little finger prick, take a little sample of blood and we can say, oh yeah, you have the Holy Spirit. You know, you're good to go. Or no, you don't, there's work. And so I really want you to hear to this message today. You know, I'm gonna separate those of you that don't have the Holy Spirit from those of you that do. And, and we're gonna, you know, we'll, we'll talk and over here, it's gonna be gospel heavy here. Mm -hmm. Here it's gonna be equipping, right? Could you imagine like right now, for the rest of your life, you couldn't know. Because I don't know if you know this about Christianity, but it's binary. It's a binary thing. It's like you're a Christian or you're not. And, and so in America, I've been sharing the gospel for a little over a decade here. A lot of people will say, hey, I'm a Christian. And I'm like, hey, do you know that you're going to heaven? And they'll be like, well, I'm not sure. But the scripture says, 1 John 5, 13, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. So there's this idea that scripture says that we can know. And so what if you could know? What if right now as you sit there, you could be certain the Holy Spirit is in me. I'm sealed for eternity. I'm going to be with God. I am a Christian, not just in name, not just in title, not just in ideology or philosophy. Like I am actually a born again child of God. And you could be certain of that. Jesus today, as he tells a story, is going to give us a sort of test, if you will. He's gonna talk through responses to the gospel, how some people respond to it and some people don't. He's actually gonna show us four responses to the gospel as we dive into the text today. As I said, we're going through this series, Summer of Stories. The reason we're calling it Summer of Stories, it's the parables of Jesus. Parable is a story that Jesus told to illustrate a point. 
It's not a true story. Typically, he would take something that they were familiar with and he would make up a story about it to illustrate a point. So whenever you hear a, a parable, you should ask yourself, what is the point of this story? Why did Jesus tell that? What am I supposed to learn from it? What was the truth for them then? And what, for the, what is the truth for us now, for the church, forever and ever and ever? So it's kind of like a riddle. You, you have to un. Lock the mystery. Today, the parable is the parable of the sower. Or I tell you, it would be more appropriately called the parable of the soils. So the sower and the soils, if you've been in church long, you've probably heard it before. And it's really the evidence that someone has heard and understood the Gospels. And the reason I'm starting with this one to kick off the series is because Jesus is explicitly going to answer the question, why do you speak in parables? And so I thought that would be a great way to start a series on parables. And so for the past year and a half here at Harris Creek, our family moved here a year and a half ago, it has been amazing to have a front row seat watching God change the lives of people. Like I, I've just seen it. Like I, I mean, people, I'm, what I'm saying is people coming to the faith. So like if you're a person, you're like, hey, I want to invest in some movement of God. I want to go where God is moving and doing something. I can think of no greater opportunity and not because I, you know, don't get out much. No, I watch I, and see a lot of ministries and I'm just amazed at what God is doing here. I think there's a unique work being accomplished in Waco that this city of 130,000 people is in the, in the national news like a, a a, a um, unprecedented or an unequal amount of times, like how much attention we get from people all over the country and all over the world even, there's a war being fought here. There's something unique happening here. God is doing a unique work here. And I believe that we, you, are at the tip of the spear in that effort, that he's doing a work here. And I've watched him over the past year and a half save people, and I've been really excited about it. In fact, just this week, a friend of mine, a buddy of mine texted me and said, hey, I just want you to know my daughter just prayed to receive Christ. And it's a family that goes here, and I just celebrated with them. And I thought about the celebration that is happening in the kingdom among the angels and saints, that that little girl goes from death to life, and, and she becomes a part of our spiritual family now. But some of my favorite stories haven't been the children who've been baptized. It's actually, I was telling the elders the other day, it's been people that have been in church their entire lives. I mean, people who have served on boards and, and been a part of 501c3s and, and different religious organizations, but something shifted. And for some of them, I would tell you, they became a Christian. I'm talking about people who've never missed a day, a, a Sunday of church. And I've had a front row seat of watching the Holy Spirit come into their lives. I've gotten emails from wives. They're like, hey, my husband is a different man. I don't know what you did to him. But I think it was a gratitude. I think it was a grateful email. I'm not sure. But anyways, those kinds of emails are coming in. And I'm celebrating the way that God is changing lives here. And so as we move into this parable, I'm going to be in Matthew 13. If you want to turn there, it also shows up in Mark and Luke. We're going to see four different kinds of people who interact with the gospel and is depicted by seeds and soil. And it's kind of like, if you think about the coronavirus, COVID-19, you know, there's four responses to it. Some people die. Some people get really, really sick. Uh, some people are asymptomatic. They have it, but they show no symptoms. And some people don't get it. You can kind of think of four different responses to that virus. And in the same way, there can be four different responses to Christianity, if you think about it like a, a good kind of virus, if you will. It's been said this parable is the most difficult parable to understand. Lucky me. Uh, theologians have died trying to understand it, and you're stuck with me. Just as a reminder, I have a two-year degree in art. I'm going to do the best I can, though. Um, it just makes it very clear that we become a Christian by hearing and understanding the gospel. Hearing and understanding is repeated. In fact, the Greek word a queen for hearing shows up in this parable uh, 16 times, 15 times in this parable. We see that word hearing, 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 and it's woven with understanding. That's sunani, 
Uh, that Greek word shows up six times. And so both of those are repeated throughout this text. There's something that you hear. The way that you're infected with this is you hear something and you understand it. You hear it and you understand it and you're infected with it. You have caught it. Let's go Matthew 13. That same day Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. He's there at the Sea of Galilee. People are swarming him. He gets in a boat. It becomes his pulpit. He starts to preach. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, uh, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop, 160 and 30 times what was sown. Whoever has ears, let them hear." Now, this is where I'm jealous of Jesus. One of many places I'm jealous of Jesus. Because like this morning, I'm gonna tell stories. I'm gonna do everything I can to exegete the text, to teach expositionally so that you understand these ancient truths in the scriptures. I'm gonna come up with creative illustrations and stories to really explain it so that you get it. Jesus shows up, tells a riddle, and is like, hey, whoever hears, good for you. It, it would be the equivalent, I mean, whoever has ears, let them understand. It, it would be, he probably taught for two minutes. It would be like if I showed up this morning, told a riddle, and then walked off the stage, like, good luck. That's, that's what he's doing here, right? But he is, he is grabbing something that they understood because at this time, keep in mind, it's an agrarian society, okay? So they, they farmed, they were farmers, and uh, you couldn't farm where the villages were or where the town was because in Palestine, the soil is really shallow and rocky. So you'd have to go outside the city and really create a bed, a field, if you will, that you would make rich for a harvest. So as farmers would walk from their community to their field, they would carry a sack of seed. And as they did on the path there, don't think sidewalk, but think path that's been worn down uh, where, they, where people would walk. It was hard like concrete. And so as they would carry that sack of seed, seed would spill out. If it spilled on the path, it wasn't going to grow up and last long, right? It would get trampled. It's too shallow there. The sun would scorch it. But if it fell off the path into the, the richer soil, you know, as you're walking along that path, you'll see where farmers had, had spilled seed. And so they'd seen this. He's using something that they've seen to illustrate his point. If Jesus was teaching here this morning, he might, um, you know, tie in like COVID-19 or something, something relevant to us. That would actually be brilliant if he did that. Uh, or he might talk about the racial tension that's in our world right now, and he might use that and teach from it. And I, I'll just say briefly, I want to insert this briefly so it's not a distraction to you if anyone's like, you know, why is he not talking about that? One, we have been. But two, at Harris Creek, I'm not looking to jump on fads uh, and, and these brief moments. I want to create something here that has long-term sustainable solutions to the problems that we see in the world. And so we're creating things behind the scene. You can trust that. You're going to see that of ways to equip you and, and to care for you. And then I would just say to those of you listening, we want to be uh, a racially diverse, we want to be all kinds of diverse here. Everyone is welcome in this place. And so as you come in here, as soon as we can swing our doors wide open, I know that you're going to see that and experience that. But anybody who's listening, I want you to know that you're welcome in this place, that we would love to have you, host you, and serve you in this place. Uh, to dive back into the parables, in verse 10, he says, the disciples came to him and asked, why do you speak to the people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets, I told you that question was in there explicitly, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you, but not to them. Whoever has will be given more and they will have an abundance. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. This is why I speak to them in parables. Those seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear or understand. And then he's gonna go into Isaiah chapter six, 
verses 9 and 10 and expound on this idea. He's saying, hey, I'm in fulfillment of what the prophet Isaiah said. And then he goes in verse 16, but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears hear because they hear. Or your, and blessed are your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you did not hear, to hear what you, uh, what you hear but did not hear it. You confused? He's saying, I speak in stories so that those that need to understand the stories, understand the stories. And those that won't understand the stories, won't understand the stories. And fulfillment with the prophets so that you will see the kingdom. Saying those who need to understand the Holy Spirit will use it and their hearts will grasp it and they will respond with joy to it. And those who will not understand will not understand. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. It's intriguing that, that people have died trying to understand this passage because Jesus says literally, hey, now let me explain it to you. And then it says there right there in your Bible, anyone who hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. They don't understand it. They have questions. They don't pursue answers. They are not open to the gospel. And so my first category, because I'm gonna give you four responses to the gospel. The first one is those who are closed to Christianity, those who can't comprehend it. They're not open to talking about it, okay? They're closed to Christianity. You, you see this in a number of ways. This is the person that you're trying to share with. They're like, I'm not listening. No, I've moved on. My heart is, is firmly over here. I'm an atheist. I'm a Muslim. I'm not open to the gospel. Right? This is the person that you're afraid that you're going to run into when you're sharing the gospel. I share the gospel. I will tell you, you rarely run into this person. You say, well, yeah, it's Bible Belt. What about New York? New York, California, uh, the Maasai Mara, the jungles of the Amazon. I've rarely ran into this person who is not open to talking about the gospel. You will here and there, but rarely. However, when I became a Christian, my roommate, he graduated from Baylor and he was raised in a Muslim home and I can remember just being so excited about this idea that I'm gonna be with God forever. And like, if like this world is vanishing and so I should live for that kingdom. And so I would tell him, I'd share the gospel with him. And he would just kind of glaze over and look through me. And so I'm trying to create a need and I'm like, man, don't you understand hell is hot? You know, and, which I wouldn't do that, but I did. And, and I'm like, you know, you're, don't, what's gonna happen to you when you die? And he would say, JP, look at me, look at me. I don't care. I don't care care what's going to happen to me when I die. I'm not thinking, I'm alive right now. I'm not thinking about that. I don't care. Close to the gospel, right? Another person that this will look like is, is someone who will seemingly be interested in the gospel, but then they get to something in the Bible or they'll have some question and they won't search out answers. They'll just not interested. It could be like seven day creation, it could be like dinosaurs in the Bible or slavery in the Bible or something that they read that they're just like, I don't understand it. And they don't search out the answers. In fact, I, I saw this last week. If you know the name John Steingard, he's the lead singer for Hawk Nelson, which is a Christian uh, group, Christian band. And he very publicly renounced his faith, said, hey, I'm no longer a Christian. And a lot of people, I do this deal on Instagram on Fridays where people can ask questions and a lot of people ask that question. So I responded to his uh, public renouncing the faith. I responded publicly with this. I said, I'm sad that John left the faith. I prayed for him and I pray that he returns to a thriving relationship with Jesus. It seems this was always missing. I read his letter and the big red flag for me was him pushing through the discomfort of the facade of Christianity. Inauthentic faith is the enemy of authentic faith. It is not second best to real faith, but the opposite of real faith. To grow in inauthentic faith is to grow unbelief, not some belief. But if you present to be a Christian while you're really wrestling with matters, you will be much worse off than if you simply raised your hand and said, 
I don't know if I believe this stuff. Can someone help me? Wrestle out loud, be honest. It will only be more difficult to be a Christian. Trials will test our faith, meaning that Christianity is not a simpler life, but it offers eternal life. And as you have issues here at Harris Creek, like I don't want to be this place where we come into this room and pretend to have it all together. None of you have it all together. You're all dealing with difficult things. Your marriage is hard. Your work is hard. Your children are difficult. Your season of life here is hard. College is hard. Wherever you're at, there's, life is hard. And we come in here and we're reminded that we have eternal hope through Jesus Christ, that we're going to live forever with God. And we learn the scriptures so that we can apply the scriptures to our life so that we know how to navigate this life. But you do not need to pretend to be anything here because as you grow in, in authentic faith, it is to grow in unbelief. And that's what happened with John. And as you have questions, ask your questions. Nobody here is afraid of your questions. You can ask anything. Just say, hey, I don't understand this. And there are volumes of libraries of books and responses to just about anything that you're going to come up against. I, I promise you, you will not ask a question for the very first time. I guarantee it. And so ask your questions. Let's grow in the faith together. As you share the gospel, I want you to remember it's very important that, that, that you know that you can't save anybody. Our job is sharing, God's job is saving, and God can save anyone effortlessly for him. Even my old roommate, he can do that. And so faithfulness, the bullseye, success for us is sharing, not a conversion. God's in charge of the conversion, that's God's success. Our success is just sharing the gospel. Verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. This is the person who hears the gospel. Gosh, hell is hot. Heaven sounds amazing. Yay, I want heaven. And they get in there and then they deal with something difficult. And they're like, gosh, I thought God was going to give me an easy life. I'm out on this. Or they, or they have to make a difficult decision and they go back to their old ways because that's what they know. What I would call is like an, an act of convenience. The second category, second response to the gospel is the convenient Christian. The convenient Christian. This person lacks courage or they lack a conviction. They're not going to fight for their faith or defend their faith. Um, they're not going to speak up for their faith. They just, you know, they want Jesus when he's convenient. Right? We, we talked about this last week. Like if you've bought into Christ because of something that you're going to gain in this world, you've bought into a false gospel. It's not the gospel of the Bible. Okay, I live this. I grew up in the church. I, uh, my dad was Catholic, so I had one church, uh, one foot in the Catholic church, one foot in the Lutheran church, and one foot in the Baptist church. I have three feet. And, and so uh, my mom was Lutheran, my dad was Catholic, and there was this Baptist youth group in town that I would go to called Teen Time. And I liked the Baptist youth group the best, Baptist church the best, because they had the prettiest girls. And so everyone knows pretty girls are Baptist. And so uh, I would go and hang out with them often, and we would go to these camps. And so we went to like Glorieta, New Mexico, Centrifuge. Uh, we'd go to these retreats called Dawson McAllister. And, and at these 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 things, these gatherings, these events, there's always this moment where this guy's patting a guitar and the speaker's speaking all sternly and he's like, hell is hot and you can go there and burn or you can go to heaven and be with God forever through Jesus and it's amazing. And then I'm out there and my heart's moved and I'm weeping. I'm like, I want to go to heaven. And so I walk, they're like, you want to go to heaven? You walk down this aisle and I walk down that aisle. I walk to that stage, you know, I gave my life to Jesus. And what I learned was the ladies liked that. They would like then swoon around and like, hey, so you became a Christian? I'm like, yeah, that means you're dateable now. I'm like, oh, cool. And, uh, and so, and, and just like, I was like, oh, wow. Like this, this you get a, a lot of attention when you do this. So that summer, I got saved like four or five times. And, and, uh, <laughs> And it was just like, it was like a response in joy. Like, oh yeah, God, you're real, sure. But then... When I was faced with the decision, like, am I going to go the way that honors God or am I going to go the way that honors myself? I always went the way that honored myself. Like, this is what I know. I'm going to do what I want to do 
when I want to do it. I'm going to go where I want to go when I want to go there. I didn't, I didn't make any hard, difficult decisions because I didn't have a conviction. I'm like, no, I'm not going to do, get behind me, say no way. I'm not going to go there. I did whatever I wanted to do because I wasn't a Christian. Said I was a Christian, prayed to receive Christ, said the prayer, had the tears, had the emotion, heart was moved. Wasn't a Christian. I mean, other than the decision to walk down that aisle, I made no decisions based on that faith. Right? And I did it because of what I would get from it. Not because it was true. Not because I'm like, hey, God, here I am. I'm your soldier. I will do whatever you please because your Holy Spirit dwells inside of me. Right? It was an act of convenience. I just say, be careful when ideas are popular. Compare them with scriptures because I see these things in the scriptures that it's not popular. And what I want you to know is that, that the Christian life is not an easy life. Like what, you know, you know what happens to Christians? They lose babies in the womb and out of the womb. They get cancer. They suffer. They get laid off. Sometimes they're broke. They can't pay rent. This happens to Christians. Remember what we talked about last week. It is God's will that you would suffer. It's one of the, the explicit God's will statements in the scriptures that you would suffer. One of f- four or five. This is, this is hard stuff. It, it, listen, your greatest disappointments come from your expectations. I want you to go into this thing eyes wide open. Christianity is not for the weak in heart. In fact, Christianity is going to give you plenty to worry about. Give you lots to worry about. It also just gives you the solution to worry so that you don't have to. You hear me? So let me say that clearly. Christianity, it's going to give you lots to worry about. But it also gives you the solution to worry so that you don't have to. And those two things, can, you're going to live forever. You can be with God forever in like this world. You can lose all things in this life for the sake of the kingdom. You're going to be with God forever. This life, this life is, is a grain of sand on the beach. It is but a vapor. It's like that bad day you had in fourth grade that you don't even remember. That's this life. That bad day you had in fourth grade where the teacher accused you of cheating. You didn't cheat. You were innocent and your, your friend left you and you felt all alone and no one chose you for kickball. That bad day, you went home crying, you talked to your mom, it was an injustice. And today you don't remember it. That's this life compared to eternity. A billion years times infinity. You gotta read verses like Matthew 24, verse nine. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Some people say the Bible was changed. If I changed the Bible, I'd take that one out. John 15, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would hate you as its own. As, as it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Matthew 5, blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Whose is the kingdom of heaven? Those who have been persecuted because of righteousness. My brothers and sisters, you can be courageous. It's because God is at your back and you are immortal till the day he's done with you. You will not leave this earth one second before he's determined. He is with you and he is for you and he loves you and he has a home for you and you're going to be with him forever. Whom shall you fear? Whom shall you fear? Verse 22. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth. Wealth is deceitful. Uh, Wealth will make you feel like a God. You are not a God. You're expendable. The deceitfulness of wealth choked the word, making it unfruitful. It's, It's describing someone distracted by the things of this world, consumed even by the things of this world. The third category, the consumed Christian. This is people who are consumed with the world that they cannot rightfully respond to the gospel. This person appears to have it all together. Uh, they, they, they have the car you want, the house you want. Their kids are smarter than yours. They got the bumper sticker to prove it. Uh, these people, like they, and they're in church, guys. They're in church. Category two and category three are in church. Category one, not not in church long, opposed to the close of the gospel, probably not going to hang out here long. Category two and 
category three, right, those uh, who respond to the gospel out of convenience, those who are consumed by the world, they will stay in church their entire lives. They, they can stay here, but they are distracted by the world. And, and they, I like to say it like this, they are inoculated to Christianity. Category one, close to the gospel, they're immune to Christianity. Like they can't catch it. Their hearts hardened toward it. They're not gonna get it. Category three, they're inoculated to Christianity. Inoculated means it's like where you receive a vaccine, you receive so much of something that you, you can't catch it because you have it, but you have a little bit of it. You're tracking with me? It's like that you hear the gospel over and over and on. Yeah, yeah, Jesus died for my sins. God raised him from the dead. Easter, put on my dress, hunt for eggs. Easter, take the picture. Easter, Christmas, let's go. Presents, nativity scene, Jesus, Christmas play. Gospel, gospel, gospel. Jesus died for my sins. God raised him from the dead. Jesus died for my sins. God raised him from the dead. But there is no response with joy. There is no emotion. There is no movement. It's like the Jesus died for my sins and God raised him from the dead. So what? I look at my car and my house and my stuff and my things and my work and my job and my kids and I'm busy and I got things going on. So what? But we can compartmentalize it on Sundays. I'll go on Sundays and I'll have a little bit of chicken soup for the soul shot in the arm, some words of encouragement so I can get through the week and get busy, 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 busy and do it all over again. And the gospel is in the back seat of your life. It does not belong there. It's the car and the road and, and, and the destination and the thing behind behind you, it's everything. There's no compartmentalization in Christianity. That's false Christianity. It's not biblical Christianity. It's not real Christianity. This impacts how you date, how you're married, how you parent, how you work, what you say, how you dress, where you go, what you purchase. This infects all of that. It's a total infection. I speak passionately about that because I was a victim of it. I went to church and was like, oh man, I was sitting, I was sitting in a row, back row, and I hear the message, like, oh man, that's good. That was a good message. Gosh, it's convicting sometimes tears. Get in the car and wrestle with it. Oh, that was a good message. I can live forever. It's a good message. A good sermon today. And then I get in my car as a Jaguar, that's type of silver, it's beautiful, black leather. Wood grains, like this light walnut, where it was a pretty car. It was an early adapter of the, the navigation system, it had this screen. And drive that. I was up, and this car is good. And drive that to my condo, which was on the top floor, and overlooked downtown. I had the balcony. I was like, man, this condo is good. And I put on my suit, and the suit is good. And I go to my job, my job is good. I'm making all kinds of sales. Business is good. Now I'm busy and being busy is good. And I'm busy, busy, busy. Good. It's good to be busy and I'm busy and it's good to be, I got to work and I pay for the car and the condo and these things are good. And what was that sermon on Sunday? I remember it was good. It was a sermon. It was like who, what, where, when, how, decisions or something about Jesus, the Bible. Was it Hosea? Was it Habakkuk? Hezekiah? Is there even a Hezekiah? But it was good. But I was distracted. They looked like a Christian, smelled like a Christian, talked like a Christian, but I was consumed by the world. Consumed by the world. I wasn't a Christian. I wasn't a Christian. I think for some of us, guys, listen, we're going to run this race hard and fast. Keep it all up. Keep the mortgage paid. We're going to trip over the finish line called retirement. And we're going to die in our sleep. And our kids are going to enjoy our stuff. And that's, that's the truth for some of us. And there's lots of stuff. There's lots of things to be distracted by. A, a friend came back from 20 years in Russia who was a missionary there. And he came back and I got the opportunity to talk with him. And I said, what did you notice about America? Like, what have you noticed changed here? 
And I was expecting, I don't know what I was expecting, but not this. He, he, the first thing he said, I said, what have, what's changed since last year in America? And he said, what are all of these garages everywhere? Like there's like these garages. And I was like, what are you talking about? He's like, on the side of the road, as you're driving down the road, there's like these garages. Sometimes they're stacked on top of each other. There's these big buildings that have garage doors. I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I would go, oh, you mean, you mean storage buildings? And he goes, oh yeah, it's like public storage. I was like, yeah, those are storage buildings. And he's like, what are storage buildings? And I was like, well, that's, that's where people put their stuff. And he goes, well, I thought they put their stuff in their house. And I said, but sometimes they have more stuff than their house can have and you've got, you rent a storage building. And he was like, let, and it was the, the confusion was interesting. He was like, let me understand. Let me make sure I get this. People build houses for their stuff, but sometimes they have so much stuff it doesn't fit in their house. So they have to buy a garage to keep their stuff in separate and apart. And it was just like, even explaining it to him was convicting. I was like, gosh, we have a lot of stuff. Plenty to be distracted by here. But, verse 23, but. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. How do you know if they hear the word and understand it? This is the one who, you should be on the edge of your seat. The one who what, Jesus? This is the one who, fill in the blank, goes to church every Sunday. The one who gives 10%. This is the one who, you know, they, they do this, they do this. They go here, they, they, they dress up for service. This is the one who, what? What do they do? He's about to tell. He's about to describe the good soil. What's the good soil, Jesus? Tell us. Tell us. What is it? This is the one who produces a crop, yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. And so if Jesus, if you were on a deserted island with the Bible and you're, trying, you're reading this parable and you're trying to understand, okay, what's a real Christian? What does is, what is a real Christian do? And you got here and he says, it's not like this and it's not like this and it's not like this, it's like this. What conclusions would you draw? What, what, what would you say? Okay, this is what a real Christian does. So my fourth category is the Christ following Christian the real Christian, the actual Christian, the one who seeks to multiply their faith, the one who understands the word themselves, then takes that word and entrusts it to others. Don't you see what happened here? The soil became the sower. The soil, that which the seed was dropped on became the sower, the one who spreads the seed. That's what happened. He says, the one who hears and understands takes this word and multiplies their faith into the lives of others. That's how you know that they understood this. It spreads. It spreads around them. It, it gains momentum. Somebody told me once, uh, here, they came up and they said, hey, sometimes when you preach, you make me feel like I'm not a, a Christian if I'm not sharing the gospel. Can I be, can I be transparent with you guys? That's how Jesus makes me feel right here. I think if I'm reading this on a deserted island, like those are conclusions that I feel like I would draw. If I'm not, like, I don't have a commentary and I'm not like going back in the original language and really trying to seek what that understand, like this is what, this is the one who. See, I think the reason people struggle to understand this passage is they ask, well, who was saved? So it's not one, it's not soil type number one. Is it two, three, or four? Where, where do we draw that line? I think some people look at it like, well, I hope we can draw that line between one and two, you know? And like, maybe that's the line of salvation and two, three, and four are all saved. But the text doesn't really leave room for that. So I would say we have to draw the line after a three and, and it's four who's saved. That's the only actual Christian. To call a convenient Christian is not a Christian, right? But what I would tell you is what difference does it make? It's very clear here what Jesus, it's not like Jesus is like, hey, and if you wanna be two and three, you can. Like it's very clear what he's, he's 
pushing us toward, right? Like this, Jesus is like, this is the one I'm pleased with. Like this is the response to the gospel that I desire. This is what I want for you, right? I don't want the, I'm not looking for you to fall into complacency due to fear. I'm not looking for you to fall to complacency due to materialism. I want you to live out the gospel so that others would respond to it and live out the gospel. And this thing would continue to grow. This thing that Jesus started 2000 years ago would continue to gain momentum, the ball wouldn't drop with us, the baton wouldn't fall with us, that we would continue to carry it forward. All of you know Christ following Christians like this. Everybody knows a number four. Right? You all know somebody, like everywhere they go, people are gonna hear about Jesus and they're making disciples and they're sitting down with them, they're teaching the Bible, they really get it, they're the real deal. You know a number four, be a number four. So that people who know you are like, yeah, I know a number four and they're thinking about you. Be a number four. Be the Christ following Christian. My, my concern for us, I don't wanna squeeze into heaven. I don't wanna sneak in there smelling like smoke. I barely got in. You know? In summary, the, as people respond to the gospel, there are those who are closed to Christianity. There, there are those who accept it when it's convenient. There are those who accept it until they're consumed by the world. And then there's the actual Christian. With COVID-19, we have a real live example of something spreading, right? Like we see it. I mean, that's, that's what's created this mess for us in the first place. We're here, every other row spaced out. It spreads. It's contagious. What if there was no test? Like what if you couldn't test somebody to find out if they had it? How would we know? Two things I think we look at. One is symptoms. Any infection throws off symptoms, right? And we say, well, are they coughing and have a fever? We can check for the symptoms. But maybe they're asymptomatic. The only other way we would know somebody has is it spreads. Like maybe somebody would catch it and somebody else would catch it and somebody else would catch it. We would trace it back to one, oh, they were around you. You must have it, right, it spreads. Christianity works the same way. The only way that you know someone's a Christian is you check the symptoms. The, the Holy Spirit dwells in their life and throws off love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control. There is no such thing as an asymptomatic Christian. Doesn't exist. The Holy Spirit's gonna do his job. He's gonna throw off the fruit. Right? But the other way you know somebody's a Christian is it spreads. They're contagious. C.S. Lewis calls it the good infection. People catch it. People are around them and they catch it. They, they get the good infection and they pass it on. I pray that we're a place that demonstrates both. We throw off the symptoms and it spreads. But now listen, wherever you're out on that faith-based journey, listen, this is what I have to tell you. You're created by a God who loves you. He's crazy about you. He desires a right relationship with you. You're separated from him by your sin. But you don't wanna worship him, you wanna be him. You wanna do what you wanna do when you wanna do it. For thousands of years, people would kill animals in an effort to cover their sin, to create sacrifices so that they could feel near God. God said enough. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into the world lived a perfect life for 33 years, and he died the death that you deserve for your greed, for your lust, for your anger, for your control. He died for that so that you don't have to die for that. And to show you that he's bigger than death, he rose back from the grave. He became back alive and showing you that you can have his Holy Spirit who's alive and well, who he can influence you towards the things of God. If you believe that Jesus Christ died for you and God raised him from the dead, then you too will be with God. Let me pray that you would. Father, I do pray that that truth would infect our hearts and change our lives and make us new. We thank you for the ways that you love us, for the things that you've done for us. Thank you for your kindness to speak to us and to give us these realities in, in these stories. Father, I thank you for life groups all over who are gathering around the message that you would continue to spur them on. And thank you for faithful friends who showed up today. 
as we navigate just kind of this weird space, Lord, I ask that you would continue to give us wisdom. And Father, if there's anybody here or anybody listening that hasn't rightfully responded to your word, Father, would you, uh, your Holy Spirit do that now? Would you awaken their hearts to that truth? We love you and we're thankful for you and we sing to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.